So, uh, what are we looking today in my presentation? Uh, I guess a lot of you is already familiar with the uh, file system ZFS. Um, ZFS was developed by Sun Microsystems and it became the technology award from InfoWorld in 2008 as, as a best file system. So ZFS claims even today that from the feature point of view, it is the best file system available. Um, my talk will be mainly about uh, ZFS, so I will inter give you an introduction and then we'll take a look at the future of this file system. So uh, let's take a look what I'm going to do. So in this talk, I will answer you some questions. First of all, the first question, what are the old and new features of ZFS? So I will give you a short introduction to the features ZFS was designed for and the features that came in during the development. The second question is what open source system, open source operating system do have ZFS? I mean, are we only limited to Sun or now Oracle operating systems and FreeBSD or are there also other operating systems ZFS can be used in? So we'll take a look at that. And uh, the last point, of course, uh, what about the future? Uh, most of you know what happened to Sun Microsystems, uh, rest in peace. And uh, the question is, how will the future of ZFS look like? Okay, so here's an outline of my talk. And let's start with the introduction. So, uh, in, in this first part, I will tell you what is ZFS, how did it get developed, um, what are the borders, the limits of ZFS, and also a short talk about the license ZFS is developed under. It is not the BSDI license. So what is ZFS? Uh, ZFS is the Zettabyte file system. Um, it was designed by a couple of features in mind that have been missing to other, operate, uh, other file systems, and let's see which features are these. First of all, it's pooled storage. That means in ZFS, we have an integrated volume manager. Of course, uh, I have speaking to several Linux people, they say, layer violation. I say, so what? Okay. I mean, there are many things or many points where communication between the volume manager layer and file system layer might be useful. For example, software rate solutions. You just have to replicate the data, not the whole drive, not the free space, if you know where the data is. Okay, next point, transactional semantics. So we have this copy on write model. That means in ZFS, when you do writing, even deleting stuff, in reality, only new uh, data is written on the drive. So when you are deleting something, it is just marked as clean. So somewhere in the future, it can be overwritten with, with other data. Okay, um, so uh, next point, checksums and self-healing. Uh, ZFS keeps checksums of all blocks inside. That means uh, the data integrity is a very, uh, is a very high pri priority of the ZFS operating system. And they have also self-healing uh, structures. So it's called scrap or resilver. Uh, this way, if you are, for example, using a software RAID or a RAID 5 system, ZFS can heal data that has been damaged on some of the disks automatically. Next point is scalability. So we'll see later in the frame uh, how uh, the limits of ZFS look like. So there, it's very similar to IPv6 <laughs> in point of this. Okay, um, we have instant snapshots and clones. So in ZFS, we can, in a matter of milliseconds, create a snapshot of the file system, that's read-only copy, and from these snapshots, we can make readable clones. And of course, we have data set compression. 
Here I'm mentioning only LZJB because in the in the original design this was the only compression method supported. Actually, this whole compression was also developed by the CSD Z, ZFS developers. This algorithm. The idea of LZJB algorithm is to be as as low to have as low CPU usage as possible. So if you are using this compression, it doesn't have a great impact on your CPU. And last point, simplified delegable administration. That means um, a system administrator should be able to pass tasks for ZFS to users. So for example, uh, to give rights to a user to make snapshots of a specific part of ZFS. Okay, so let's take a look at the ZFS history. Uh, I will try to do this short. So here have you an, we have an overview. Uh, the first ZFS came in uh, October 2005. Uh, it was introduced in the Open Solaris operating system. And it took about uh, almost one year to be released in Solaris 10. Uh, the very first version was pool version 3 in Solaris 10. Uh, the pool version 6 was ported to FreeBSD in 2008. And as you can see, uh, FreeBSD always was lacking behind Open Solaris and Solaris because we have only a very limited manpower in porting. And at that time, I wasn't, do, I wasn't helping yet, so the most work was only done by Pavel Jakob Davidek from Poland. Good, uh, in FreeBSD 8.0, we had pool version 13. Uh, and in 2010, Open Solaris project was closed by Oracle. That was one of the new actions when Oracle uh, took over Sun. And uh, shortly later, they released Solaris 11 Express with new features that aren't available to open source anymore. Uh, in 2011, there have been activity in the Linux front. Um, as you can see, we will see it also later, there, are, there is a Linux port of CFS. In FreeBSD 8.2, we have pool version 15. This was kind of an intermediary work because 28 was not yet ready for production. And now in 2011, we are going to ship version 28 with FreeBSD 9.0. Yeah. So let's take a look at the limits. So what are the limits of ZFS? First of all, it's a 128-bit file system, so it's quite future ready. We don't have 128-bit computers yet, but the file system is already designed in this way. And uh, the maximum pool size, so the maximum storage space that can be allocated by ZFS is uh, 256 quadrillion zettabytes. So it's, there is explained to be readable. And uh, the maximum size of a file system inside of this pool or the maximum size of a single file or even an attribute of these files is 16 exabytes. So one file can be 16 exabytes big. I would like to see another file system that has this limit. And the maximum pool file system and snapshots are 2 to the power of 64. So it's also quite a lot. I mean, I have never created so many because uh, I don't think it's scalable to this point. <laughs> so. Uh, what does ZSS con consist of? So ZFS has two main objects. First of them is called pool, and the second one is called dataset. So let's take a look what a pool is. So a pool is actually a storage container consisting of virtual devices. These are called VDEVs in ZFS terminology, and this can be, uh, the main ZDEF commonly used is actually a disk device. It may be, of course, a partition in FreeBSD, any kind of Geom object. And we have other ones. We have a file device. That means it can use a single file to allocate storage. Of course, this is recommended only for experimental pu purposes. So if, for example, ZFS testing is done, it's testing on these file devices. Then we have uh, these, these first two devices, I have told they're the basic devices, and then we have combined devices. Uh, combined devices, for example, a mirror. Mirror groups two or more basic VDEVs, and uh, it mirrors all data on these VDEVs, on all of the mirrors inside. 
Then we have a RAID, RAID Z2, RAID Z3. That's some that's a RAID implementation, a software RAID 5 or 6, or a number that doesn't exist for triple parity. It's not specified. Uh, these are RAID implementations on ZFS. Good. Then we have spares. So when we have a RAID system, we have also a hot spare device that is used to replace damaged devices or failed devices in a RAID Z array. And last, but uh, then we have a lock device. Um, it was also uh, designed uh, for a purpose to speed up writes. That means we can have a separate intent lock for a system. That means all writes are first done to this lock, then to the main system. Uh, last but not least, we have a cache device that's used for speeding up the reads, mostly allocated to SSD drives. So the ZFS uses a primary cache called IRC, ARC, and you can extend this primary cache with, with a secondary cache that's placed on uh, disk devices. So let's take a look at the data sets. Uh, each pool in ZFS contains at least one data set. And uh, these data sets are ge a generic name for, first of all, a file system. So we have a POSIX layer. We can put files directories on it. Then we have data sets that are volumes. So in ZFS, we can like create a volume. And a volume is automatically exported as a disk to the, as a disk device to the system. So we can like put UFS on top of ZFS by using this volume. We can do with this volume whatever we want, like with any other disk device that's available in the system. Then we have snapshots, the read-only copy of a file system or volume, and these snapshots can be accessed at any time. If it's a snapshot of a file system, then we can directly access files uh, in this snapshot, and if it's of a volume, it has to be mounted, of course, but read-only because it is not readable. And we have clones, and clones are actually something like a readable snapshot. So from a snapshot, we can create a new file system that uses, because of copy on write, the initial contents of the snapshot. And uh, this way, you can save space and you can clone your data, for example, for testing. Uh, a lot of my co customers is using this for testing. So let's take a look at the license. Uh, ZFS is not BSD licensed. The license is CDDL. Um, this license is on the Mozilla public license version 1.1. This license was, license was originally designed by Sun, and uh, the uh, points Sun wanted from the license designers have been, the main point of this license was it has to be GPL incompatible. So they said, let's take a look. Mozilla uh, is actually GPL incompatible, so let's take it as a basis for our license and let's create something out of it. Of course, this makes Linux users angry because Linux for Linux users, GPL is you know their politics and ideology and everything. So uh, everything that's GPL incompatible for Linux users is like life incompatible. You know, uh, it doesn't exist. So uh, it's 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 quite a problem. Uh, of course, like GPL, if, uh, if you distribute binaries, you have to distribute the source code. So it's not like BSD. Uh, but the source code is limited to a term called covered software. Uh, covered software means original plus modifications. So if you make any changes, they have to stay CDDL. Uh, it might be part of a larger work, like for example, FreeBSD, and this larger work may contain other licenses, and they don't change. So it's not like in FreeBSD they have discussed this GPL v3 problem. CDDL doesn't require you to change the other licenses, and this way we can have it inside. But we, it, it can be distributed directly in the kernel, because that is, isn't the larger work anymore. That would be covered software. So we, we, ha we have to distribute it as a module. Good, uh, modifications must be CDDL, and there is also a tricky clause. All contributors, in point of the license, have to be disclosed. So if I make a change in a ZFS file, I have to m add my name into it, otherwise it's not licensed. So I lose the license, I'm breaking the license. Good, uh, let's continue. Oh yeah, uh, one more important point at the last. This license terminates 
if you make any patent infringements against the author of the software or any of the contributors. So if, if, if for example, some company does show you of this, they have actually no license to use or reader or code or whatever, so they can't use it anymore. That's kind of protection. And uh, what, I, what I didn't write on this slice, there is also a, a rule that you automatically grant access to all patents you have that are in this code. So if you are using this code and Oracle stays in the license, you are automatically granted a royalty-free license for all the patents which are written in ZFS, if there are any. So uh, they cannot show you because of this license. So uh, let's take a look at the feature history of ZFS. First of all, the versioning. Uh, each ZFS pool and also each ZFS data set, they have a version number. What does this mean? Uh, sometimes in the development, incompatible structural changes happen in the, in the file system layout, and these changes lead to an increase of this pool or file system version number. Um, this way, backwards compatibility can be provided, so you can use earlier ZFS versions on a newer ZFS system, but it doesn't work the other way around, so forward compatibility is not provided. So you cannot use ZFS 28, for example, on a ZFS 15 system. ZFS 28 pools can be used only on ZFS 28 system and higher. Okay, uh, version downgrade is also not possible, so once you upgrade, it's forever. Good, and uh, the last open source ZFS pool version is 28, and as we will see, uh, Solaris 10 update 10 has already 29, so you cannot work anymore with these pools, so you have only uh, the option to create 28 pools in Solaris, and then you can read them in FreeBSD, but it works the other way around, so you can make a 28 pool in FreeBSD and read it in Solaris. Okay, uh, the last open source file system version is five. There are diff two different versions, one is for the pool, one is for the file system. Okay, so let's take a short look at the feature history. So the features increasing the pool version number. So the very first one was actually hot spurs and double parity rate. So at the very first ZFS it was not inside, in version three it was introduced. Then we got gzip compression introduced in version five. Separate intent log devices for speeding up writes in version 7. Delegated administration in version 8. Ref quota and ref reservation, that means that you can like reserve space for a data set, it was in version 9. Uh, cache devices, that's the second level cache was in version 10. Uh, user group space accounting, that's, cook, that's the typical Unix quota we know that was introduced in version 15. Before that, you, you had only per file system quota, so for the whole file system, not for individual users and groups. And continuing with triple parity rates in version 17, so that will be actually new to FreeBSD. Nine, uh, snapshot user holds version 18. Uh, that means you can like lock a snapshot from deleting. Then we have the removal of log devices. Many people have requested this. It was not available, so you could like add five log devices to your system and you, was, you have been unable to remove them. So that was quite crazy. Um, it happened to me as well that I have added like log devices that, uh, by mistake. You know, just added a log device to the, to the pool and say, oh, okay, I'm screwed. Um, continued with the deduplication in version 21. Receive properties in 22. System attribute support in 24. And uh, data set encryption not available to open source in 30. Uh, a short information also to ZFS, one of the main features I personally use is the ability to send snapshots to remote systems and download them. And also not only snapshots, also the increments of these snapshots. So it's, 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 it's quite interesting and that's actually one of the killer features for my use of CFS. So other important features that do not touch pool versions, we have device auto expansion. That means when you replace all your VDEVs with larger ones, for example in a mirror, 
the whole ZFS pool grows. It's possible to grow it automatically without reboot. Then we have ZFS pool recovery. That is, it is able, the ZFS system is now able to recover some types of damaged pools. Um, we have the duplication also of these ZFS send streams. That means you can also deduplicate in ZFS send receive. What? The sender and receive is the ability to send snapshots to a remote system. So you can, you can send a snapshot to a, another system with ZFS, it receives this and it rebuilds the whole system depending on the snapshot. And you can also send just increments between two snapshots to the, to the other system. This way you, can, you have a light, lightweight data replication system, it's possible. Okay, uh, we can split mirrors into separate pools after version 22. That means that if you have one mirror, you can create two pools. This way you can actually take the second drive and move it elsewhere. Before, when you remove the device from a mirror, the device was not accessible by ZFS anymore. So you couldn't, couldn't harvest the data on it. Um, then we have a thing called uh, Z intent lock synchronicity setting for data sets. Uh, this was also requested by many people. Uh, many people requested that they have data sets with not as important data for, for, for storage, but they want it to write as fast as possible. So they don't want the data to be written immediately, but uh, they said they have time, but they want it to be faster. So this way you can like turn off the immediate synchronization for a specific data set, and uh, then the data is written only on the end of each transaction group, but that's also that is already part of ZFS internals. So you can ask me about that later if you have questions. And then we have a diff feature between two snapshots and you can make like ZFS diff and it shows you all changed files and directories between two snapshots of a specific file system. What? Uh, only, only the files and directories that are changed, not the actual content. But that also, it's not bad because the snapshots, uh, it's, it's not as easy. If you use the normal diff or compare and so on, it takes, it takes much, much longer. So let's, let's have a look at the ZFS operating systems. We have two groups of operating systems using ZFS. First, first of them are from the Sun side, Oracle side, that are based on OpenSolaris. And then we have other operating systems like FreeBSD. So, uh, Systems based on OpenSolaris, so we have OpenSolaris itself. Uh, it is already discontinued. Uh, we have Oracle Solaris 10, that's a commercial system. We have Nexenta Core, by the, uh, distributed by the Nexenta company. We have the Open Indiana, that's actually the continuation of OpenSolaris. And then there are two systems I personally consider somehow dead. Bellanix was developed in India. Is not going on anymore, the development, and I don't know if a uh, German developer, Jörg Schilling, has enough, enough time to develop his Schilix, because his last release is also in the past, so I guess it's, it's like dying. Okay, uh, let's take a look at the two main ones. First of them is OpenSolaris, so the project is discontinued. Uh, it's the source of ZFS code for everyone else. Uh, ZFS was introduced there in 20, 2005, so this was the very, very, very first revision of ZFS. Uh, last public commit was in August 2010. This was the very last revision and then it was the final stop by Oracle. Uh, also the bug database, it was a very, very valuable resource for our developers and me uh, is closed. So we don't have access to it anymore. Uh, there have been like bug descriptions. It was uh, like linked to the commits, so we can we can read and get a, uh, quite a lot of background information to each, co each commit that helped us uh, solve many of our problems. So it's it's away, and the free successor to this system is called Illumos. Uh, the really it, the Illumos itself makes no releases. These are called Open Indiana currently, but it's a different project. So uh, Oracle has Solaris, it's a commercial operating system. Uh, ZFS was introduced in 2006. Uh, the latest version is ZFS 29, now from August 2011. I have used the last patch cluster on my Solaris systems yesterday, and there is already ZFS 29 inside. 
but the data application feature is disabled in this system, so it's not part of it. Then we have Solaris 11 Express with a very interesting license. The license called, uh, you can use this software for testing only. And you cannot publish benchmarks and you cannot publish anything. So I'm not publishing anything. Okay, uh, there is ZFS v331 inside or the VSD application. Uh, I would really recommend for all ZFS users to take a look at the Oracle Solaris ZFS administration guide. Yes, it's actually the Sun ad, uh, administration guide with Sun replaced with Oracle. Uh, they, they didn't make any changes to that. Uh, or at least not no important ones. Okay, other operating systems. Uh, ZFS originates from Open Solaris. Everybody else has to port it. So we have FreeBSD, Linux, Debian, yeah. Okay, this is a kind of port of FreeBSD, so they use our kernel, so they have also the features. Mac OS X is also, uh, okay, there is something you can use, but I don't consider it stable. And in NetPSD, the development has also stealth. So by Adam Ham, it was actually, there was a preliminary port done by Adam Hamshik, but he is also not continuing any work on it. Good, uh, short view of Linux. This is my favorite Linux logo. And uh, as you can see, free as in freedom. Um, yeah, this is the official ZFS on Linux logo. Uh, we have two projects, ZFS Fuse project and ZFS kernel models by Brian Bellendorf uh, from the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. Uh, Brian believes or they believe that they can distribute this as a module, completely separate code. So if, if you compile it yourself, and add as, a, add as a module to Linux, you are actually not breaking GPL because GPL, GPL limits only the distribution of binaries and source code. So uh, you, you get a separate source code, you can compile it and you can use it. Uh, it's pretty functional. I have also submitted uh, uh, bug fixes to this Linux distribution and, and uh, uh, yeah, it's slow. <laughs> it's slower than the FreeBSD implementation. Good, uh, FreeBSD, yeah, this is our logo, as you can see, nice one, uh, not really. Um, yeah, uh, we have introduced this in 2007, latest port version is 15 in 8.2 release and the current version is pool 28, so uh, 9.0 release and uh, 8.3 release is go going to have free, uh, ZFS 28. Uh, documentation, we have a wiki, uh, it's more or less updated, but some of the information I'm not considering up to date anymore inside, so I, we should, someone, whatever, should update it because people are still following all the rules and they write me, I have done everything that was in the wiki and I look in the wiki, well, it's old, it's old, okay. And we have manual pages, it's, it's are the same main manual pages that are in Solaris. Uh, support, we have PRs, problem reports, uh, mailing lists, forums. So uh, let's take at the last part, and that's the future of ZFS. Um, okay, so first of all, ZFS at Oracle. There was a leaked internal memo in August 2010, and uh, they say, well, let's continue developing ZFS, but we don't like the open source thing not that much, uh, making it public, ah, no. Okay, so it's not public, but uh, yeah, Let's leave the possibility to probably make it public someone in the future, you know, someone we want to throw the project away or whatever, and we can stay. So they had said, okay, it will stay CDDL. So it's like quite funny. It is CDDL license, but all developers have to sign that they are not allowed to publish anything of this. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. But the CDDL license actually forces you to publish stuff. So I'm asking myself, um, yeah. They are breaking their very own license or... Because they are not only the, the only licenses. I mean, in lots of the code, there are already contributors, even in the code Oracle uses. So, well, that's a question. Um, they also have written that the CDD calls should be like published with Solaris releases. You know how often a Solaris release happens, like every 10 years. So, 
Yeah, that's the question. And uh, it should be like available to OTN partners uh, who are the industry partners of Oracle. Intel? Yeah. So you can forget all small companies or stuff like that. Okay, the current pool version there is 31 in this Solaris Express release. Yeah, Ilomos. Uh, ZF, uh, Oracle has lost quite a lot of its developers and they have moved to a different project called Ilomos because they ha haven't been happy with their open source policy. Um, the goal of this Ilomos project is to provide a free uh, open solar resource and replace the closed parts. And it's sponsored primarily by two companies. One of them is called Nexenta Corporation and the second one is called Delphix. I'm currently in touch with these companies. These distributions that build on Ilomos are OpenIDNI and Nexenta. So, uh, last part is then ZFS development and the future. We have like four developers. The main one is Pavel Jakub Davidek. Let's say he did like 95% of the work. Uh, then we have me. I did maybe like 3% of the work. <laughs> we have Andre Gapon, about whatever, 1% or something like that. And you have Xin Lee. He helps also in big, uh, bug fixes. He's, he's working for IX systems. Um, yeah. And let's take a look at well, how does the state of the development look in FreeBSD. So we have pool version 28. Um, we are importing new changes and features from Ilomos. There are some bug fixes and also some new features. But no, no change in version numbers. So it's taste 28. Uh, bug fixes we make to the common ZFS called. I am reporting all of them to back to Ilomos so that we have like some kind of cooperation. Um, bug fixes to, we have bug fixes to FreeBSD specific code, for example, the loader, uh, VM code, and so on. And uh, there is vo ongoing work uh, on the ZFS fault damage daemon by Justin Gibbs. Uh, we have also two other committers who are doing something in this tree, but not very much. One of them sits here. Uh, yeah. Uh, the purpose of this daemon is actually we are missing stuff like automatic hot spell replacement. So there is like a daemon that should be reacting to events and, and make changes in ZFS. Uh, and of course the jail support of ZFS needs some work. So it's not, not completely ready yet. So future of ZFS. First of all, ZFS will stay at version 28, at least in our uh, open source systems. And it, this will probably happen until Oracle releases this code. If they don't do it, this policy has to change. Or, you know, ZFS will die in the time if there is nothing, nothing new. Uh, second point, there are neither plans nor manpower to maintain a fork. So we don't have enough developers to do some kind of completely new fork of GF, ZFS and do, do this. We don't have manpower, we don't have the money, no resources. Uh, very important for us, very crucial, is the interaction between FreeBSD and Ilomos because the companies behind Ilomos that are financing this open source development, they are paying quite a bunch of developers doing ZFS stuff. So all the common ZFS stuff that's common to FreeBSD and then Ilomos, we are profiting from these changes as well if we import the new features. Um, we have some private features in FreeBSD like this CFSD. There is some ongoing work on this. But as I said again, it's, it's, we have not enough people. So that's, that's the main problem and uh, it will stay like this. And of course, bug fixes, bug fixes, bug fixes. We have a lot of reports, bug reports, and uh, someone has to work on it. So I have been do doing quite a lot lately, um, but I also can't spend all of my time to do this. I have to leave from something. Good, uh, so thank you for your attention, and if you have any questions, I feel free to answer them. Ten minutes for questions. Any questions? What, what we are missing, uh, we are missing some kind of uh, 
interaction system that reacts to changes in the system. So if you are losing like a device, or an, the main problem not losing device, ZFS is ready for losing devices, but if a new device is added to the system, ZFS has to be informed some way that, that it happened. We don't have this on a running system. So it, there should be some kind of system daemon. Uh, Sun Solaris, they have their own daemon for this purpose. Uh, and this daemon is integrated to their system. You, they, it does also other tasks, not only ZFS. So this is a part, this is a part of code we are missing. Okay, so suppose uh, you hot plug another disk. For this example, yeah. yes. Or so you that is like, you have, uh, uh, for okay. example, that if you re-add a mirror disk or something that is automatically replicated and stuff like that. So Yeah, I was wondering about that. So let's say I have a mirror and I have a spare yeah, yeah. that mirror. We, we don't have automatic spare management at the moment. Currently you have to issue comments by, by, yeah. uh, commands by, by, your, by yourself. Okay, thank you. I mean, uh, we have DevD, and isn't DevD designed to this kind of events? The, the, system? the, the problem is ZFS manually is, is defined by him by itself. Okay, but we so, can. So the interaction between the main systems is is just uh, well, the, the there has to be something that provides this information to it. DevD doesn't doesn't give information to ZFS about structural changes on a running system with mm. devices. Okay. Maybe maybe we can also ask uh, Alexander, he can tell us more because he is one of the developers of this. Uh, actually, as, as far as I know, uh, Solaris used some kind of DevD but extended uh, to close or cooperate with ZFS. So they also have some uh, even stream to user level, but it's not just a, a set of st strings, uh, declaring events, but a complicated structure with all details. So what changed in the pool, what this come, go, and uh, all changes. And in fact, uh, ZFSD uh, goes to do some like stuff. So it receives events from, from DevD uh, stream uh, in simple way and communicates directly to uh, ZFS to fetch an additional information. So we was uh, talking with uh, Justin Gibbs. So it would be nice to extend uh, FreeBSD DevD protocol or replace it with something more complicated, with not just uh, strings, but some key value pairs, arrays, trees, and other stuff like uh, Solaris has. So, uh, no, as I've said, at this moment, ZFSD only uses uh, DevD interface. Uh, the other is just ideas. So if somebody wants to start, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we are always open for new commitments. So, <laughs> if someone has to do wants to do something, we are always open and happy to see new developers <laughs> doing new stuff. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Also, common questions to ZFS. No problem. I can answer. Yeah. Uh, just one question with uh, synchronous sprites on NFS. Um, was there any performance profiling done on FreeBSD? Because I know, for example, um, situations with VMware, when you share out uh, NFS share from FreeBSD with ZFS in the back end, and um, you have performance issues with synchronous sprites. So you either have a log device or uh, you can disable the synchronous sprites, which breaks. Um, which doesn't break anything, but if uh, you have an unclean shutdown or some yeah, sort of uh, I, I am well, I, I'm well in, in knowledge about this performance issue. Well, the main problem is ZFS is very strict. That means if you issue a write with the OSync, that means with a synchronous flag, it writes immediately to this and everything else has to wait. So for example, as to my information, uh, for example, Linux file systems do not obey this so strictly like this. So, 
so they will they will like delay the riots a little and so on and uh, this way you have like quite a huge performance in increase but uh, as i said the data integrity is like the priority number one of zfs uh, so you have to find a way to disable this one of these is dis disabling this point there is a quite a discuss discussion about this in the mailing list so if you take a look at the freebsd fs or freebsd performance mailing lists there has been a discussion uh, about about this topic so you can you can see also what users have right also some developers answered there is there is quite a lot of users using zfs also on larger arrays using like raid z with 40 uh, devices and so on and they have quite a lot of experience with this so some of them are using log devices some of them aren't using this and they, there is there is quite a living discussion or at least has been what i have read about about these topics so there is quite a lot of useful information I so if Solaris, you want some details i think that in solaris they solved it somehow with nfs too so nfs knows about when to flush or how to flush or something like that um, so they have better performance with well, uh, yeah, so yeah. Uh, this this, the, this synchronization setting th that was actually introduced by Solaris even. So they they needed like even more to to be able to uh, deactivate this. But Solaris has also some different structures how also the ZFS memory is managed. So uh, of course ZFS runs at fastest on Open Solaris based systems. So if you have a Solaris or if you have an Open Indiana release, ZFS will be at fastest there. The advantage, of course, of using this on FreeBSD that you have the other features like the firewall implementation and so on, you don't have on uh, Open Indiana. Mm -hmm. Maybe one more. Yeah, what, as to my information, I have experienced, yes, that there are still issues like, you know, double cache. That means that uh, data is cached in ZFS R IRC, also in the ARC adaptive replacement cache, and at the same time is also cached in our VM. Uh, it's, it's, it's mostly done when you have uh, partial reads of, of files. Uh, there have been even problems with this. Uh, our, our, our VM, uh, or not, not me VM, the better word would be like VN <laughs> system of the VNodes, uh, that has, uh, we, we do this caching for all our file systems. That's the problem. And it's, it's, it would be not as easy to turn this off for, for, for ZFS. Thank you. Yeah. Any more questions?